Hey everybody, welcome to day two, Breakfast with Bob from the New York City Marathon. We are presented by Polar and sponsored by You Can and Babbittville Radio. Our next guest, amazing young man, just ran a 237 at the Chicago Marathon to break his own world record for double baloney amputees, Mr. Marco Cicetto. Marco, how you doing? I am doing pretty good. So, Marco, take me back. You, you're in, you're, you're in uh, Kenya, and you're thinking about going to college. What led you to University of Alaska Anchorage? The opportunity, you know, getting out of Kenya is not an easy thing. No. So once that opportunity came that I have been accepted at the University of Alaska Anchorage, I didn't care where it was. So I was like, I am going. Kenya is pretty warm. It is. Alaska is pretty cold. Yes. How hard was that for you to adapt to that? It was a challenge because I got there in August and the sun would be up in the middle of the night. <laughs> you know, in Kenya, we get 12 hours of sun and 12 hours of darkness. So that was a very dis- different... That was harder, huh, to deal with. Yes, but the cold itself was not bad. It's the darkness that can it, That's get a problem. You. Yes. And, but you ran well there. Yes, I did well. Yeah, I did really well, you know. It, Growing up, my dad used to tell us, you don't have to get everything 100% for you to perform. You have to adapt to situation. So things are going to happen, you just have to deal with them. Yes, because you cannot change how, you know, the, particularly the weather pattern. Natural right. stuff. It's the way it is. When you saw snow for the first time, where did you, did you know, had you seen snow before? Mm-hmm. And, and, and where did you think it came from? You know, I had seen snow on the top of Mount Kenya, but okay. that is like, I had never even went top there. Yes. But from my previous experiences, I thought, you know, this is like accumulation of morning dew over time. Oh, it's like morning dew yes. just coming out of the ground. And then it freezes and then stays there, but then it started falling from the sky. <laughs> Which so is that a was little... new. <laughs> <laughs> so the snow's coming down, but you're still running well. Yes. And then you, your cousin William, yep. who's also a runner, comes to run at University of Alaska Anchorage as well. But he didn't adapt as well. Could you tell early on that he was having a problem with the dark and the cold? No, there were no signs that he was not having fun. And you know, we, when we all went to Alaska, we were in our mid-20s somewhere on the yes. early 20s. So it was a fun time to be away and have fun in this right. new place. So it didn't, we didn't see anything in him Yes, that would tell us or some red flags. No, right. he was just... Have, having fun. He seemed like he was having a good time. And he was doing really good in school. Yes. And he was running well. Very well. So when he killed himself, hung himself, total shock. Yes, it was a total shock. And he had, you know, called me before that. So he, then, you know, I didn't realize what he wanted to talk about. Right. So I, like everybody else would be like, let's talk later. You know, right, I sure. am doing something else right now. We'll and talk the a priority later. will be let's finish our assignment and then we'll talk later. It was a Friday. Yes. Yeah. And when after he killed himself, did you feel guilt that oh gosh he called me maybe I could have done something? Yes, there was that enormous guilt in myself. I thought well I could have just offered myself that quick right. time and talked to him. But but I didn't know what. Of course. Like, it's it's an afterthought. You know when. He had already right. killed himself. The depression that you dealt with for that next six months or year, um, how hard was that for you to deal with and to still try to run and still try to be competitive? It was really hard. You know, and you know, with depression, everything else becomes a big problem. Yes. You know, it makes things look harder than they are. Right. So I was really struggling. But in the middle of it all, too, I was on a denial. I didn't accept that I was really depressed. So that was a big, big, big. That was it. That you didn't. You didn't. didn't I did not accept that. Yes, this is a major depression. I was fighting it, saying, "You know what? I'll deal with it." Well, you're an athlete. I get over you. You have obstacles. You get by them. Yes. So sometimes that can be a problem because you think you can overcome everything. Now I am a big advocate of no. If you have something. If you are not, if there is something bothering you, share with somebody. Right. Share with a friend. It's really the first step to recovery or to solving the problem. So then one evening you go for a run 
and you end up, do you remember laying down in the snow or is it sort of a fog? You know, I had taken a ton of antidepressants right. before going for a run. And then within, I don't know, but I'm basing it on my estimation of where I think yeah. I lost my um, recollection. I yes. think it was like 10 minutes of the run. 10 minutes in? Yes, very, very, and very early. I don't remember, you don't remember anything. what happened after that. So, did, at that, three days, it was like three days later, you end up staggering into a hotel, uh, in the, collapsing in the lobby, and they'd been looking for you, right? There was a all points bulletin out trying to find you, and then when you ended up in the hospital, what do you remember from that time of your life? When I stumbled to the hospital, uh, to the lobby in the hotel, I just remembered somebody asking me where I had been for three days. Yes. And I didn't really think I was out for that long. Right. The last word I remember from him was I could hear him talking to somebody saying, you know that Alaska, the, the, the university runner that was lost, he's here with us. But then in my head though, I still think, like when I'm trying to think what do I remember from that moment, I thought I knew what happened from the hotel to the hospital but you don't no, remember any of it i don't remember any of that because i don't even know how what happened when i walked into the hotel you don't remember that at no, all no nothing the only thing i remember was i was feeling a lot of pain in my hands and yes. i didn't know where i was but there's one distinct voice that was in my head that i could hear him talk to me over and over yes but i was not even able to open my eyes to see who he was later it was the surgeon who did my surgery Oh, he was a surgeon. That's yeah, what you remember. Yeah, who was just talking. To, that is the only, and I don't know what he was saying, but when he would talk, after I had like been stabilized, I was able to tell, this is the person that I have been hearing over and over and over. Sure. So, yeah, so there was no much uh, recollection of what happened between the time I entered into the lobby and when I was in the hospital. And this is the strange part, because I was feeling a lot of pain in my hands. Yes. The doctor was like, how do you feel about your legs? I said, my legs are good. They your are not painful. Okay. No. No, they are not painful, but my hands are so painful. The doctor was like, yeah, that's a problem for your legs. It's good that you're feeling pain in your hands because that's a sign of life. But if you are not feeling pain in your legs... That's a problem. That's a problem. Wow. And so how long was it before they said, we need to amputate your legs? I think they knew it right away because... When I first was taken to the hospital, I was not feeling anything. Right. And it didn't improve. They did the electrolytes to check my blood flow and there was really nothing on it. But uh, I think three days later, four days later, they were able to tell me there is like a 90% chance that they will have to take both my legs. But they didn't know how far. They said, we are still monitoring to see Oh, it might have been above the knee, knee it could have been below yeah, the knee, you didn't know. Uh, just around the angle, so they didn't know. Well, and as somebody who grew up his whole life running, knowing there's a chance you could lose your legs, that's pretty much your identity. How yes. hard was that for you to deal with? It was really hard, and I was, you know, it's that moment you ask yourself, what am I supposed to tell myself now? Right. Because there was no warning, there was nothing coming out your way that would tell you this is about to happen. Right. So now I'm sitting there trying to internalize, thinking, how am I even going to tell my parents about this? Right. So, so there was yeah. a lot of things. And I'm like, what is next? After the amputation, where are they going to take me to? Are they going to take me, put me in a plane, get me back home? Like, what am I going to do? Am what I gonna even going to be functional again? Right. So there were so many uncertainties in my life at that point. And at that point, you're not married or have kids or anything no. like that. You're single at that yes, point. Yes, I am at that point. And you, but you were still a runner at, uh, at up in Anchorage. Yes. Yeah. So now your legs do get amputated. And do you think that sometimes I look at what happened to you, and I know the guilt you felt because of William. Do you feel like, okay, my legs were amputated. I feel that I've sort of paid for my guilt by losing my legs and I'm okay now? No, that's not how I felt. What really helped me, yes. after losing my feet, I asked myself, if you didn't even have control of your own body, right. making sure that your legs don't get amputated, how would you have 
helped somebody else that you didn't even know what he was thinking. That's a good point. It really helped me thinking of it that way. So it helped you rationalize that you know there really wasn't anything I could do. Yeah, because if if there was anything that I needed to do and I had control over was my own body, but still I didn't. You didn't have control of your own body. No, no. So when did you feel that you could run again? You know, I felt it when I was still in the hospital and before my amputation. I had not even seen somebody walking on prosthetic ever. No, I had not even heard of somebody running or on anything other than their biological feet. Sure. But at that point, I was getting a lot of visitors. A lot of people brought me books, videos of you know Paralympic athletes. Right. So then I was like, oh, if somebody else is doing out there, then yes, I am doing it. Well, especially because you were already a runner. Yes, and that really, really helped me. And at that point, though, before even. I, before I was fitted with my running legs, I started having a purpose in life. I knew exactly what I wanted to do before even getting fitted. Really, I was still like laying down there, going, "Yes, this is gonna be challenge, but I think I know what I will do. I will run again on prosthetics." And when you ran for the first time, at, well, first you had to walk. Yes, <laughs> that was probably a challenge. Yes, it was. And how long was it before you went from walking to running? You know, I got my running legs in December of okay. 2011. Okay. And by spring of 2012, I was running some five k's on my walking legs. Right. And then at that point, you know, the word started getting out there. You know, there's this guy who is running again, and somebody from OSA representative Brooke. came to uh, the prosthetic clinic yeah. in Anchorage connected me with Brooke and then Brooke introduced me to CAF. Yes. Then I got my first uh, running leg, the flex run. And when I first fitted that leg, I was with my assistant coach then. And without even trying them, I felt like I could sprint on them. And we had a challenge. I said, how about a hundred meters challenge? Yes. And it went really well. I almost fell at the finish line. But it went really but well. But you ran okay. Yes, at that point I knew, oh yeah, this is this going is to be, be good. Yes, it's going to be fun. Well, I know originally you thought, well, I'll go to Paralympics. Yes. But because of the height thing, yes. they were basically said you needed to run at 5'7 or something, and you were 5'9 before yes. you lost your legs. Yeah. So that didn't work out, but you ran to the roads and yes. ran, was your first race like a 5K or 10K? Uh, after I tried the Paralympics, I just switched. To, I said, I'm going to run marathon. Marathon. Did, you went right yes, to marathon. Yes. I said, I'm going to run the marathon. <laughs> but I didn't know when I was going to start the marathon because I made that decision in January right. of uh, 2018. Right. But then I was still in Alaska. Then I you know, talked with my prosthetist because I had switched to yes. Stan Patterson in Orlando. Yes. And I said, you know, I wanted to really switch to marathon. This short distance thing is not clicking. No. And he said, the first thing, though, that we have to do is get you out of Alaska where you can train throughout the year. Yes. So go to Orlando. I'm going, okay, that's like going to train in a sauna. But anyway, we'll give it a shot. Way better than cold. Yes. So I moved to Florida and then started training. And working for Stan. Yes. Making my, you know. Learning how to make prosthetics. Yes. So then... And then you called me and said, we're going to have you run in New York. And I'm going, that's not going to happen. That was, that was last year. Yes. That's right. <laughs> so then I came to New York last year and it went really good. You were 252? 252, yes. 252 your first time. Yes. And this was like, you know, at mile eight, telling myself, oh, well, I got this. I, you know, I didn't realize that. There's a lot of things you have to do while running a marathon. 26.2 miles is not just 22.2 miles. Yeah. It's a long You got to eat and drink and all that yes. type of stuff. Yeah, and worry about rashing on your legs yes. and all that stuff. Yep. And, but 252, then all of a sudden people are like, well, the world record is Richard Whitehead with 242. Yes. And then you go to Boston. Yeah. And now you weren't really, you, when we first chatted, you're going to go to Boston because they were announcing they're putting prize money for the amputees for this year, 2020. Yes. And you weren't going to run Boston. No. Because it, it had been freezing cold the year before. Yes. You, you've learned that freezing cold isn't good. Ah, uh, it's not good for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
you go to Boston and you break the world record. And yes. 242 something. Yes. Did that surprise you? It, it, it surprised me because it, I was not going to just crush it. And I didn't have the specifics of what the world record was. Right. At my 22, I realized I could run a 242. But then I couldn't remember what the seconds was. Uh, yeah. I said, you know what? I'm going to push myself and see if I can get this. Right. And I got it. That was so cool. And then I didn't know you were going to go to Chicago. Because it's just like, oh, wait a second, he's running Chicago. And you go there and run 237? Yes, my goal though, <laughs> going to Chicago. I was aiming to run a 230. And I had trained for a 230 pace. Like, my training was yes. right at that. Right. But the issue that I had with Chicago. Yes. I did not warm up. It was cold the entire time. Right. And on the bottom of my stumps, it felt like, you know, it was just kind of, it had a different feeling. Because right. The cold. But other than that, you know, it went great. 237, I'm like really, really happy. About World record. Five minutes yeah. of my previous record. See, and what you got to learn, Marco, is you don't want to take five minutes off. You should have gone 240. You know, 241. Right? And then yeah, you get more money for every marathon you go do. And then you bring the world record down slowly. But, yes. you know, I'm going to Boston. Yes. I was going for 230. You're going to Chicago. Chicago, 230. Yes. But then 237. So I still have seven marathons to lower it there down by a minute. Exactly. So so here in New York is 236. Is that what you want to run? Actually, no. Okay. Here in New York. I it's am a harder here race. in New York. To celebrate my one year anniversary of running marathon. Yes. I did not run a marathon as an able body athlete. That's right. So this yeah. was your first marathon the, and New we, York we was, brought you here as part of our CAF contingent last year. Yes. To run your first marathon. So from all the good things that has happened, I said, you know what? Instead of just closing the year without doing anything, how about going to New York and just having fun? Just exactly. Enjoying myself. High fives. Yes. You know, doing... So, to, uh, Sunday is not... I'm not under any pressure. None at all. No. But the only problem with runners, though... Yes. You And somebody is competitive. You are on that start line telling yourself, I'm not going to go crazy on this. But then when that gun goes off, you go you're like, crazy. ah, there's no way this guy is passing me. I'm going. <laughs> but I will really try to just tell myself to take it easy because I just ran... Three weeks ago, yes, and my body is not ready for another man. No, 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 no. So you'll just take it easy. Yes, kiss babies, wave to the crowd, yes. enjoy yourself. A and parade, you know, you do know, a parade. You know, sometimes, uh, all the time though, the the fans, the crowd is like the incredible part of running. It actually. is. Yeah. So I said, how about dedicating one year to your fans, just having fun, and if there's somebody who needs a high five or a hug. Give them a hug. Exactly. They hear that you don't have to like put a lot of pressure on yourself because the next one that I'm not going to look onto the fans is running Boston 2020. So this is dedicated to all my this. fans out there and all my supporters who are yes. out there. Sunday would be just like, if there's somebody out there who really wants to have a hug on the course on Sunday... This is the opportunity. I am not going to do it again. No, <laughs> you're not doing it in Boston. No, no, no. no, no. This is the opportunity. Boston will have prize money yes. for amputees for the first time. Yes, and you know, for and that is where we really. This is what I feel. We don't have ambassadors for uh, running on prosthetics. Right. For my classification, we don't. And I, you know, we always have that say. They say somebody need, need to do something. Right. But then I th thought, who is that somebody who needs to do something? You are. It's me. Exactly. So next year is not even about the price money. It's about making sure that the world knows that people who run on prosthetics are very competitive. And opening that platform, taking it to a different level, a competitive level where people out there will be like, yes, this is where we need to invest on. These guys are not a joke. No, and we just had you... You doing what you 237, and then really the same weekend, Roderick Sewell was a double above knee amputee, finished the Ironman World Championship, and became the first athlete to do that. Yes, it that changed was, everything. That was really incredible because I was still uh, laying in bed, and my wife is like, "You have to come and see this." 
you know, somebody in, is in CNN. I was reading something you're on CNN, and your Roderick. friend, yes. Frederick is on, uh, Roderick is on it. So that was really, really inspiring. Love it. Now it's giving me a challenge. I'm saying, before I retire from running, am I gonna have to do an Iron Man? Oh, I like it's that. It's the swimming part, but I live in Florida now. The ocean is like. 20 away. miles away from yeah, my yeah. house. They have these things called swimming pools. We yes. Can, we can help you with swimming. I think we might have to do that. Yes. So a year you. from now, we'll be talking about you as a triathlete. Well, we'll see. I love it. Marco, as always, th and thank you for what you've meant to CAF over this last year. Having you here, having you here in New York exactly a year ago and watching what you've done, going from 252 to 242 to 237 all in one year and shattering the world record, it's very very special to watch. And I'm also really grateful for CAF because if it were not for them, I you know, it's the part that I don't want to think about because when I think if it were not for CAF, where would I have been today? But then I said, why do you have to think like that when CAF is there and you are here? It's a time to say thank you so much for what CAF has done to me. Marco, thank you, buddy. Thank you. Marco Cicetto has been our guest. How about a round of applause for the great Marco Cicetto, world record holder as a double amputee for the marathon, 237. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Bob.